Thank you very much. Um, first, I wanted to thank the organizers um, of this very nice conference and also very nice place that is becoming nicer um, by the minute. And um, I wanted to say that this was originally planned as a project together with uh, John Barrage. This was before the pandemic. We talked about looking at, at this um, topic. Then there was the pandemic, so this collaboration could never happen. So I did it alone, essentially. But still, I wanted to give him credit. OK. Yeah, so what, um, what is the topic here? So what we wanted to do, and then what I then did, was to really have an explicit um, description of a to have Vero Barrett Westbury state sum, so concrete, really, with summation over simple objects, and the state sum model um, with defects in it. Um, so I'll first explain a little bit what the to have Vero Barrett Westbury state sum is, and then about the defects. So to have Vero Barrett Westbury state sums are essentially a concrete model for um, to have zero GQ of T. Um, and they're also useful in topological quantum computing and condensed matter physics. So essentially, um, Gitarre's quantum double model and uh, levin wen models are the two-dimensional part of a to have zero state sum. And one can see this really explicitly if one uses a state sum formulation for these models. So basically, what one has to do is oriented Piecewise linear three manifold and the triangulation. So the piecewise linear is not important. One could also work in the smooth framework. And um, then one, one takes this categorical input, the spherical fusion category. And what one does then is one assigns to the oriented edges of the triangulation, one assigns simple objects. Um, this assigns to the oriented triangles in the triangulation. So morphism spaces given by the objects on the boundary of the triangle. And um, to the tetrahedra, it assigns six J symbols. So the six J symbols are also known under the name F matrix. And geometrically, it just means one takes the dual of the two skeleton of the tetrahedron, so a dot on every triangle, then connect them with dual edges, and then you get a picture here. And this picture is then viewed as a picture in a, um, as a diagram for a spherical fusion category. So here one has a morphism, say from the object B to A tensor K. Then here one has another morphism from A to I tensor J. So these are the morphism spaces for the triangles. And one sees one starts with B, one ends with B, and the rest here denotes the trace in the spherical fusion category. If one doesn't like that, one can also see this is just an expression that encodes the associator of the spherical fusion category on the simple objects. So this is a concrete way of expressing the associator, and this is a number. And I, for me, it's a complex number because of our focus. Okay. And this one then defines the state sum. One simply takes the sum, the product over all these complex numbers for the different tetrahedra in the triangulation. One assigns to every um, edge the dimension of the object that is labeling the edge. Then one sums over um, all labelings with simple objects and over dual bases of the morphism spaces for each triangle. And one has a normalization factor that is given by the dimension of the spherical fusion category. So altogether, um, this gives a number if the manifold has no boundary. If it has a boundary, then I have to fix the labeling at the boundary and the morphisms there. And I can also see this then as a map from some, some vector space associated with the boundary to the complex numbers. And this is a topological invariant and defines a TQFT because essentially the choice of the triangulation does not matter. And how one does this in practice is by considering Pachner moves that relate different triangulations. And the 6J symbols satisfy certain relations, um, orthogonality relation and biedenhahn elliott relation, which essentially just mean pentagon relation for the associator and invertibility of the associator. And in this way, one gets an invariant. Um, and that's just a number if the manifold is closed, and otherwise it's, it's a linear map. Okay. And the aim was to make a simple model, really in the spirit of the state sum model, with defects. 
So on one hand, for the construction of defect TQFTs, it's sometimes good to have a concrete model also to compute um, things explicitly, and also maybe for applications in topological quantum computing, because these models are really closely related to guitar and data values. And the idea was to do this via graphical calculus in the same way as it's done here. One translates the tetrahedra basically in diagrams in a, in a, in a monoid in a spherical fusion category. And the idea was to do a graphical calculus that also incorporates the defect data and then to define a similar model with defects. And this graphical calculus must then combine the spherical fusion category data and the higher categorical data for the defects. Okay, so the higher categorical data for the defects is essentially known from earlier work. So there was some work by Toral and Berelisier and Balsam Perilov on line defects in such models. Um, there was some work by Tetar and Kong in the context of the Win-Wen models that identified the defect data. And there's also there was a work by, um, by Fuchs, Schweigert, and Schaumann um, on a modular functor constructed from, from high model categories. So essentially, this tells one what the correct defect data is. And there's, of course, been other work since, for example, the work by uh, Kakeville and Müller, they are also very similar defect data. Okay, so what do I mean by defects? So I consider um, defect surfaces, so they are an oriented, um, embedded, um, so we have a manifold, um, a free manifold with boundary, and then we have defect surfaces, which are um, oriented, embedded, piecewise linear, two manifold that is contained in M. And it has to be embedded in such a way that the boundary of the surface is contained in the boundary of M. And then we consider a directed graph on the surface that consists of defect lines and defect vertices. So what I do not admit is that different defect surfaces meet in a, in a point, like um, a full stratification or something. So for me, the defect surfaces are embedded um, to the manifolds. Okay. And the categorical data on assigns to these um, defects is first um, outside of the defects and the connected components of the complement of the defect surfaces. One assigns spherical fusion categories um, all over the complex numbers, but they, they may be different. So the defect areas, so the complement of okay. um, I can find out. Um, well, yeah. Are you signed in or it doesn't, it doesn't stop the call? It, it signs in. Ignore it. You can ignore it. It, it happened. It, something Zoom does, but it's the call still running. Okay. Yeah, it's no one complains in the chat, so I think we're good. Okay. On the connected components of the complement of the defect graph, which I call defect areas, one has bimodule categories with bimodule traces. Over these spherical fusion categories, I'll explain this in a minute. On the defect lines, which are the edges of the defect graph, um, one has bimodal factors, and then on defect vertices, one has bimodal number transformations. So essentially, the picture looks like this one has here the surface, there one has spherical fusion categories, which are always in black or gray. Um, the colored letters, the colored calligraphic letters, are bimodal categories. The bimodal functors are the lines, and then one has a bimodal natural transformation. Okay. So I explain um, what the categorical defect data is. So because everything in this model is, is based on traces, we will need traces here too. And essentially, we consider bimodal categories with bimodal traces. So um, we asked us that these categories um, are finite finite semi-simple bimodal categories. So these are just categories with an action functor that describe the action of the spherical fusion categories. So one is one that acts from the left and one that acts from the right. And then one has three coherence isomorphisms that tell me it doesn't matter if a first tensor and then act for both categories and it also tell me it doesn't matter with which category I act first. 
So this is this is um, coherence isomorphisms for these trimodal categories. And then the traces. So the traces are linear maps from the endomorphism spaces of the objects in the bimodal categories to C, and they satisfy the usual properties for a trace. So they're supposed to have a cyclic symmetry. Then they have to define a non-degenerate pairing between different morphism spaces. And they also have to be compatible with the action. So that means they have to be compatible with partial traces that I can take with respect to the spherical fusion category C and D. Mm -hmm. And these bimodal categories, together with the bimodal functors and bimodal natural transformations, they form a pivotal two category. This is due to Gregor Schaumann. So the objects are bimodal categories with bimodal traces. And they should be finite semi simple here. The one morphisms are the bimodal functors. Um, bimodal functors are just functors between the bimodal category that have additional coherence isomorphisms that tell me it doesn't matter if I first act and then apply the functor or the other way around. And they're C linear and left exact. And in this setting, namely finite semi simple, it means that they're exact. The two morphisms are bimodal natural transformations. And the compositions in this um, pivotal two category are the compositions of functors and natural transformations. And um, the duals are given by the left adjoints of these functors and the co-evaluation and evaluation. And in this setting, um, the functors have left adjoint and right adjoints, and the left and right adjoints are isomorphic. Okay, so the simplest example of such data would be to consider spherical fusion categories that are categories of G graded vector spaces. So for some group G, which is supposed to be finite in the following. So we have two groups, G and H, and for both of them, we have categories of G graded vector spaces. And one can here choose the triv trivial pivotal structure and the trivial co cycles to make things simpler. And in this case, the indecomposable bimodal categories are given just by finite transitive um, sets with an action of the product of these two groups. And the um, bimodal functors um, take representations of the action groupoids. And the um, bimodal natural transformations, they give morphisms of representations. And if one puts um, non trivial co cycles, then one gets essentially something like projective representation of the action group points. Um, but yeah, this is just a simple example. Okay, so this is the defect data. And the idea is now to take this defect data and combine it with the spherical fusion category data into a diagrammatic calculus. Are there questions so far? Yeah. So if you fix a spherical fusion category, the trace for the bimodules, is it fixed or can we have different choices for the trace? So that you don't have so much choice in this trace for the bimodule category. So this is essentially, so this was the work of Gregor Schaumann. So this is essentially fixed by something like a dimension matrix that combines the dimensions of the simple objects in the spherical fusion category and the module category. So the question is, why does it exist? Okay. So sometimes in physics, people think of a, what they call a space filling brain. So I was just wondering if this defect could ever have a three dimensional region in it. I mean, I did not this. Is there a reason? What do you mean by three dimensional region in the defect? Like, oh, so having, instead of like a two dimensional sub. The elemental ones that are different dimensional manifolds meet in some sort of grid and so on. Okay. So this, so in this approach, I don't know how to do it, and I explain why. Um, I think it can be achieved with this orbifoldization approach, but then you have to ask Nils Kakovil and Lukas Müller, yeah. and I'll explain why it's uh, at the end why it's not so easy to achieve that. Okay. Okay, so the diagrammatic calculus. So essentially, we need diagrams for the defects, and we need diagrams for the spherical fusion categories, which we have already, and we want to combine this. Okay, so what are the diagrams for the bimodal categories, bimodal functors, and bimodal natural transformations? That's essentially 
just diagrams for a two category that looks just like diagrams for a monoidal category, only that the, the regions in between the different edges are also labeled. And here it's essentially two category diagrams for cut. So we have lines that are labeled by functors. On the lines, we have dots. And between the lines that are labeled by natural transformations, and in between the lines here, we have labels for the bimodal categories. And the evaluation of such a diagram gives a natural transformation. And this natural transformation is thus obtained by applying the functors on the left and the functors on the right to the natural transformations. Yeah, so in this case, the evaluation is first compose F from the left with sigma, then compose L from the right um, with rho, and then compose them from top to bottom. So here it's just rho L composed with F sigma. It's a natural transformation. And the naturality tells me I can move the dots on different lines up and down, and I get the same evaluation. So I could move this up and the other one down, and I get the same evaluation. So that's simple and well known. It's also the same, um, essentially the same um, pivotal two category diagrams that were already there in the first talk. Um, yes. Then maybe we should talk about the duals. So the duals are given by the adjoints of the functors and the evaluation and co-evaluation of the adjunction. They look like this, they're drawn with a little arrow here. And um, satisfy the usual snake identities and um, the usual condition for pivotality. So if I turn everything around by 360 degrees, then I get back what I have before. Okay. So the next step is to combine these diagrams with the diagrams for spherical fusion categories. And the idea is to just overlap them. So one has a diagram for C, um, one has a diagram for D, and the diagram for C crosses over everything, and the diagram for D crosses under everything else. And in the middle, one has a diagram for the bimodal category. And that's now the question is how to integrate the data for the spherical fusion categories. Well, if they are overlapped, then here in the background, there's some bimodal category. And then I just interpret the objects and the morphisms of the spherical fusion category as action functors and action natural transformations. So this stands for a functor, and uh, the vertex stands for natural transformation. So this way, this can integrate the spherical fusion category data in the higher categorical diagrams. Yeah, and then the question is what to do with the crossings, because if I overlap three different diagrams, they will cross, and the crossings are labeled with the coherence isomorphisms. So I can have a crossing between C and D, the categories C and D do not have crossings um, inside them, but they can hear different categories crossing. And this is just the coherence isomorphism that relates the left and the right action. And I can have a crossing between a line labeled by, by a spherical fusion category and a functor line. This is just the coherence isomorphism that characterizes the functor. And similar for the other categories. Okay, so this looks now like the diagrams for a braided monoidal category. And it satisfies the same identities, in fact. So, for example, I can slide um, vertices over crossings. So, here it's just the naturality of this um, bimodal functor um, datum. Then I can also slide um, vertices on the functor lines. That's just the condition on the bimodal natural transformations. And there are also analogs of the right Reidemeister two and Reidemeister three move. So one just states that these are isomorphisms. That's the Reidemeister two and the Reidemeister three is some coherence condition on the functors. So this way, one can have a diagrammatic calculus that combines the spherical fusion category data and the bimodal category data, the higher data. Okay. But this is not sufficient because in the end, one wants to build something like bimodal, uh, like um, six J symbols out of this bimodal category data. So somehow one needs to make a number out of this. So that's the next step. So what can one do? So one places a mixed diagram that has data from bimodal categories and functors and so on in the spherical fusion categories and places it in a box. 
one gives to the boundary segments objects in the adjacent categories and to the endpoints of the lines morphism C. So this is the diagram before. Now it's placed by a in a box. Here we have regions labeled by categories. So I take here an object of the category N. Here I take an object of P, and so on. And here I put morphisms on the boundary that relate what is on the left of the line to what is on the right of the line. So here I put the morphism from N to F of P. Here then from P to K of M, and so on. And at the bottom, it goes in the other direction. Okay, given such a diagram, I can basically cut it on the left side and straighten it. So then it becomes a line that is labeled by the objects in the bimodal categories and by the morphisms, and then I have functors and natural transformations here on the left. And this I can evaluate. I just say here, I go from N here with alpha to F of P, and then here with F of beta um, to fk of m and so on. So just it means applying the functors um, to everything that is on the right. And if it's a natural transformation, I take the component morphism. So this composes to a big morphism from the object n to itself, an endomorphism. And then I can make a number by taking the bimodal trace. So now I've associated a complex number. OK, here already the data. Um, the condi conditions on the data tell me I have certain invariants. For example, I can move up this dot for rho, I can move it higher and down the dot for sigma. Um, but there are more invariants, and that comes from the properties of the traces. So the properties of the bimodal trace are on one hand the trace is cyclic. Then we have a compatibility condition with the module category structure that looks like this. And the conditions on the functors imply also, like the definition of the pivotal structure in this pivotal two category, imply also that I have a similar diagram for functors. Okay, what is this good for? This additional data um, allows me to conclude that the diagram evaluation is invariant under rotating the and under rotations essentially. So what I can do is I can take a, a line that is at the top of the diagram and just move it here to the bottom. And this has a well-defined meaning that's just composing with the co evaluation. The evaluation. Similarly, I can lines, take lines at the bottom, move them up to the top. And if I move up and then move down again, um, I get what I had before. And also, if I just move up everything to um, move it up like this and move it down again on the other side, I have a two pi rotation, and this is the identity. So the diagrams are really diagrams that live on a disk. I call it polygon diagrams, but essentially it's a stratified disk, and I can evaluate a stratified disk with this data. Are there questions? OK. OK, there are some further identities these diagrams satisfy, and they correspond to cutting and gluing the polygons. In the same way as one cuts and glues polygons when one derives in, in basic topology surface group representations. So here one fixes representatives for the simple objects in the spherical fusion categories and also in the bimodal categories. And I consider this fixed. And what one can then do is glue these polygons by summing over either the simple objects or bases of the morphism spaces. For example, this here stands for two for the product of two evaluations of polygons. So I have two different polygons, but they have a, a common morphism here and common objects here. And if I sum over the morphism space associated to this boundary, then I get the evaluation of the glued polygon. So this is one of these cutting and gluing um, identities. What one can also do is glue around the vertex. So here one has two sides that match and the vertex in between. Here one does not only sum over bases of the morphism spaces, but one also sums over the simple object that sits at the vertex. And then this diagram closes and one has re removed this. And here the dimension is just the trace of the identity morphism in the bimodal category. Mm -hmm. Okay, then one has additional identities. One can glue a two-gon to a sphere Essentially, this gives just the dimension of the bimodal category times the spherical diagram that was inside. 
So I glue the top and bottom of this diagram and I just get from this bimodal category the dimension. And um, one can also have addition, one has additional identities that allow one to cut and paste spherical fusion category data inside these polygons. So you have some purely spherical fusion category data outside, then I have this data repeated inside. So I needs to be simple and X can be arbitrary. And then I could just take this, this alpha here and replace it by this morphism side. So this allows one to glue the spherical fusion category data. Okay. And this is basically the foundation for generalized fixed plate symbols and how one defines the states are modern effects. So now we take an oriented three manifold with effect data and we take a triangulation. But here it's important that the triangulation interacts nicely with the defect. So it's supposed to be transversal and generic. So transversal means that whenever I intersect defect surfaces with triangles in the triangulations, they intersect in a line that has endpoints on the side of the triangle. And if I intersect the defect surface with a tetrahedron, then I get a polygon that has endpoints on the edges of the tetrahedron. So that's transversal. And generic means that simply no vertices of the triangulation should sit on a defect surface. No edges of the triangulation should intersect the defect line. And no defect vertices should be inside the triangles of the triangulation. And you want the intersection to be a single line and a single polygon? Right? Yes. Yes. So basically, if it intersects at all, then it can now only intersect in two different ways. The first is that it intersects in three edges of the tetrahedron that are adjacent at a common vertex. And the second one is that it intersects in four opposite edge pairs. And of course, the data inside the defect surface can look a bit different, but it should it, it should not lie on the, on the boundary of the tetrahedron. So this is essentially the two ways it can intersect. And the edges that intersect the defect surface, they have a canonical orientation that comes from the surface. So it can be oriented by the normal vector of the surface. And for the other edges, like the black edges here and the gray edges, it's arbitrary how they're oriented. And then um, one can say such a diagram, one labels it. Well, one labels the edges that do not intersect the defect surface, the simple objects in the spherical fusion category, and the edges that do intersect the surface, one labels them simple objects in the bimodal category. Okay, and now one can evaluate this. So this labeling um, for the edges that assigns certain um, morphism spaces to the triangles. And these morphism spaces depend on the objects of the edges, but they also depend on the functor lines that kind of go inside the triangle. And to such a label tetrahedron, one can then associate a generalized 6 J symbol as follows. So I take the edges that do not intersect the defect surface, and then I draw the dual graph there. So this triangle here becomes a trivalent vertex here. And um, then I draw this a bit longer and make it to go to the defect surface. And in this case, one has just two, two lines, then one gets two lines um, that, that end, start and end at the defect surface. Okay, the next step, once one has drawn these tools, is just to project it on a defect surface. So then one gets a polygon diagram and the conditions on the defect data tell me it doesn't matter how I project. So I could take this alpha here and I could move it a little bit down or up. I would get the same evaluation of the polygon diagram. So here there are polygon diagrams and um, then I evaluate them. And these are complex numbers that are the generalized six J symbols. So that's what it looks like. Okay, now one could ask, what is the meaning of these generalized 6J symbols? Well, um, the usual 6J symbol um, for the spherical fusion category encodes the associator of the spherical fusion category. So that's just an, another way of describing the associator on the simple objects. So this should also encode some coherence isomorphisms. And indeed, ah, I forgot. It's independent of how I orient the edges that do not intersect the defect surface, and the others are oriented canonically. Okay, so how does one get back the coherence isomorphisms? 
Well, this is one of the six taken modes. Here I could say that the functors are not present, so they're just all identity functors, and maybe all of the bimodal categories here are the same. Then the diagram simplifies and looks like this. And this is precisely the, the 6J symbol that would a generalized 6J symbol that encodes the C module category structure. And if I put all the, if I say here, I want to have the spherical fusion category as a module category over itself, which I can always do, then I get back the 6J symbol that describes the associator. Similarly, for the second one, I can ask the functors to be trivial and all the, the categories to be the same. Then I get the coherence isomorphism for the, for the bimodule structure. And if I just take a spherical fusion category over itself, this becomes the associator. And one can go on, one can also describe a 6J symbol that describes the module functor structure for both of the, of the action. So in this way, this, this composes all the different coherence isomorphisms that are there. So now the state sum, one can define in pretty much the same way as it was defined before. So I take a three manifold with defects and a generic transversal triangulation. And I label, the, I fix the labeling of the boundary edges with simple objects and the boundary triangles. Then I define the same thing as it was defined before. I take the product over all six J symbols for the tetrahedra. Only it's now generalized six J symbols. I multiply by the dimensions of the simple objects at the edges, and I sum over all the labelings in the interior. And the result is a complex number. So everything is as before: generalized six J symbols, dimensions, sums over labelings of the simple objects for the internal edges, and sum over the morphism spaces for the internal triangles and some normalization factor for each of the spherical fusion categories. And from the way this is defined, one sees immediately, yes, so this is defined as a number, but I could also define this as a linear map that goes from the tensor product of all of these morphism spaces at the boundary to the complex number. Okay. And from the way it's defined, it's clear that if one has no defects present, then this is just the usual to arrive Vero Barrett Westbury state sum, because the 6J symbols are then the usual 6J symbols. And this is, this, yeah, this is limited. And it's also clear that it's compatible with gluing in the same way as the usual to arrive Vero Barrett Westbury state sums. So if I glue to um, three manifolds again um, over a common boundary, it just means I take the state sums, multiply them, and sum over the simple objects and morphism spaces at the boundary, which before were fixed, and now the boundary is internal. So everything is summed over. Okay. Yeah, so, so far so good, but there are two, two things one really would like. The first thing one would really like is that it's triangulation independent. And the second thing one would really like is to see what is the result. Like, what can I compute with this? Um, is it useful? Um, can I understand what it gives? And so on. And these two things are in fact linked. So naively one could think, now I'm going to prove triangulation independence by using Pachner moves. That's not a good strategy for two reasons. The first reason is that this would be incredibly complicated for all the different 6J symbols. So that's not, not efficient. And even worse, the Pachner moves. So here, everything is defined for a generic transversal triangulation. But if I apply a Pachner move, it need not stay generic and transversal. For example, I can have two tetrahedra that are glued along a triangle like this. And then here I have a defect, and here I have a defect as well. And that's perfectly fine. Each of these two tetrahedra is generic and transversal. Now I try to do a partner move and add another line, and then suddenly um, the three resulting tetrahedra violate this condition. So that's why partner moves is not so good. And instead, the strategy is that one subdivides the triangulation until it becomes quite fine. So then one defines a fine neighborhood of the defect surfaces, evaluates this, and evaluates the rest. So what do I mean by a fine neighborhood of a defect surface? So it's a three manifold um, that is triangulated by a, tri by a generic transversal, transversal triangulation. 
such that the intersection of the boundary, the defect surface is the, is the boundary of the defect surface, and all vertices of the triangulation and edges that do not intersect the defect surfaces and triangles that do not intersect the defect surface are in the boundary of the, of the manifold. So the simplest example is this. So here I have the defect surface. Here I have triangles and, and, and edges that do not intersect it. They're in the boundary of the triangulation. So I could not glue this triangle here to another triangle um, that does not intersect the defect surface. Okay, and such a, a fine neighborhood has always topology interval times the defect surface. Okay, and what one can then show is then whenever one has um, one has a three manifold that shells to a fine neighborhood of the defect surface. So shelling just means it can be made into one by gluing or removing tetrahedra. Um, that's essentially when it's PL isomorphic, uh, PL homeomorphic. So whenever one has such a manifold that shells to a fine neighborhood of the defect surface, by shellings that remove or add only tetrahedra that do not intersect the surface, in this case, we can compute the state sum simply by projecting the boundary data, the boundary triangulation, or the dual of the boundary triangulation um, on the defect surface, and then cutting the surface to get a polygon diagram and sum over the, the morphism spaces and over the um, simple objects of the side of this polygon diagram that are glued. So for this picture here, I don't need to cut the polygon. It is already a polygon. Um, the resulting diagram looks like this. So there I just draw the dual of the boundary triangulation. I project it, and then I get the diagram, which I can evaluate. And the proof of this is essentially just induction. One glues tetrahedra on it. That's what the shellings mean. And then one uses the, the identities for the polygon diagrams to, to, to show that this holds. So it's just cutting and gluing identities for the polygons. And this also gives us a corollary um, invariance under generic and transversal Pachner moves to so those Pachner moves that respect the condition. Because um, whenever one has a Pachner move, one, has, uh, one relates two fine neighborhoods of a defect surface. Um, and more specifically of a defect disk. And the boundary triangulations agree, so I will have the same evaluation. And this is a picture of all the partner moves one can have um, if, one, if one has generic transversal triangulations on both sides of the move, here with the defect surface. And these partner moves have also a meaning. So the, the meaning of these partner moves is simply the pentagon relations and the hexagon relations um, for the coherence isomorphism of the defect surfaces and defect data. So in the usual spherical fusion categories, I have the associator, and to satisfy the pentagon relation, when I have bimodal categories, I have other coherence isomorphisms, but they also satisfy pentagon and hexagon relations. And these pentagon and hexagon relations are encoded in, in these different partner moves. But one also sees here there's not even any bimodal functors or natural transformations that it would be hopeless to kind of work through this list to, to show everything. Okay. And then the, the result in the end is that um, whenever I have two generic transversal triangulations that agree at the boundary um, of some three manifolds with defect data, then their state sums are equal. And the strategy to prove this is to refine the triangulations by um, putting stellar subdivisions between generic and transversal tetrahedra. And after I've refined the triangulation enough, then all the tetrahedra that intersect the defect surface, they form a, fi a fine neighborhood of the defect surface. So if I have two different triangulations, I have two fine neighborhoods of the defect surface and they are piecewise linear homo homeomorphic, that means they're related, related by elementary shellings. And then one can apply the same. So these shellings um, with, that are shellings with tetrahedra that do not intersect the defect surface, they just act on the diagrams by pasting spherical fusion category data on the diagrams. And one can now apply the inverse of these shellings um, to, the, to the triangulation, uh, to the remaining part of the triangulation that does not intersect the defect surface. 
Well, the part that does not intersect the defect surface, that's a usual to arrive Vero Barrett Westbury state sum, um, for which one knows already the, the invariance. And if one puts the two together, the fine neighborhoods of the defect surfaces and the complements, then one finds that the state sum degree. And in this way, one can then also drop the requirement that the triangulation is generic and transversal. So if it's non-generic, I just have to move the defect data a little bit. And I know from the evaluation that does this does not affect the result. And if the triangulation is non-transversal, well, then I can refine it until I have a tr um, transversal triangulation. And I know that this gives me the same result in whichever way I refine it. And then one has a general definition. And one sees that this is really topological invariant in the sense that it doesn't depend on the chosen triangulation. I mean, of course, it depends on where the defect surfaces are and how the defect surfaces are embedded. So it's not independent of the, of the embedding of the defect surface, but it's embedding invariant under the cho choice of the triangulation. Okay, so then one would maybe like to look at some examples um, to see if one can actually compute state sums. So the simplest example would be to consider a defect sphere in a ball. And this can be realized um, with four tetrahedra. So here I have a big tetrahedron subdivided into four small tetrahedron. And here inside I have the defect sphere that is just a smaller blue tetrahedron. And this is just labeled by a bimodal category. Here in the inside and the outside of the sphere, I can have different spherical fusion categories. And then one can evaluate what is the result. And what one gets is the dimension of the bimodal category divided by the dimension of the inner category that is inside of this small tetrahedron times the state sum one would have um, if one had no defect sphere inside. So just the empty tetrahedron um, labeled in the same way it's labeled here at the boundary. Okay, so this is for the three ball without the defects. Then um, one could also look at something one could call a cylinder with a defect surface. So one considers um, as some surface of genus G, which is called sigma here. The manifold, the three manifold is just interval times sigma and the defect surface um, sits in at one half. And what one can then do is to compute this in principle, one, one could compute it for a general spherical fusion category, but this would just yield something incredibly complicated. So here, I will just do it for the simplest case, namely dike graph where the um, defect surface is labeled by um, a, a finite transitive set with an action of two different groups. So the group G and G prime are for the spherical fusion categories on the two sides of the surface. And um, this transitive um, G times G offset is the label of the defect surface. Okay, what one can then do is start to choose the triangulation of the surface. And um, then one can just use prisms um, to, to get a boundary triangulation. So here I have my triangle on the surface, then I have a triangle on top, and then I connect them by lines to subdivide into tetrahedron. Okay, this picture we had before already. So here I should say this I, J, K that are simple objects. In this case, these are just group elements. And these blue elements, M, S, U, and so on, they're elements of the set X. Okay, so now one can evaluate this and, and really compute the state sum with this formalism. So here one has the, the corresponding diagram that one evaluates with the diagrammatic calculus. And what is the result is the following. So first, um, the state sum is zero um, unless the data on the upper and the lower boundary, they each define a group homomorphism from the fundamental group of the surface into the group G and G prime. So this is to be expected because for each triangle, one gets the condition that is familiar from Dijkraaf written that the, the group elements must mu multiply to the identity. So this is to be expected. And then one has also some influence of the defect surface. And this influence of the defect surface has to do with the upper group homomorphism and the lower group homomorphism. It imposes a relation on them. 
So generally the result is um, I get a group homomorphism into the product of the two groups. And what the state sum gives is just the, the cardinality of the fixed point set under this um, under the action of the group, of the fundamental group given by this group homomorphism. Okay, that's the general result. And now one can check for consistency um, what it gives in some extreme cases. So the first extreme case would be a transparent defect. Then I just say, okay, on top and on bottom, I have the same group and the G set that labels the surface, it's, it's just the group itself with the left and the right action. And that should give back, back uh, should give back digraph written. And indeed it does. So in this case, one sees um, the state sum is zero unless the upper and the lower group homomorphism are conjugated to each other. And when they're conjugated, then it just gives the cardinality of the stabilizer. Okay, the other extreme case would be to just say, well, I take a trivial uh, set with a trivial group action. So I have just one point in the set. Um, that's that's the strongest defect I can have between the two. And as one would, would expect, in this case, this condition relating the group homomorphism becomes trivial. So in this case, the state sum is always one um, whenever I have an upper and a lower group homomorphism and there's no relation between them whatsoever. Then one can, of course, take intermediate cases and one can consider G sets given by some normal subgroups and so on, and one can, can compute this pretty explicitly. Okay, so that's one example. One can also do more complicated examples. For example, I could ask myself if I take a, um, some three ball, inside of the ball, I have some genus G defect surface that is embedded maybe in a, in a prescribed way. Um, what does the state sum see of this embedded surface? Like, does it see the embedding? Does it see the genus of the surface? How does this manifest in the state sum? And at least in the simple digraph written case, one can compute this. So um, this is the picture how to compute it. Um, this looks more complicated than the, the computation actually is because one here needs to draw everything, but one, one can really evaluate it. And what the result is, is the state sum is a product of the state sum one would get if one has nothing inside of the three ball. So just the, the same boundary labeling, but nothing in the interior. And then this is multiplied with a factor that involves the cardinality of the, of the G set. Well, the cardinality of the group that is in the interior of this genus G surface. And then um, the stabilizers, um, the cardinality of the stabilizers with respect to the G action and the G prime action. And here we have the genus of the surface. So from this one can see that it detects the genus of the surface. Now one can ask, does it detect only the genus, but does it also detect how the surface is embedded? And principle one would want that it detects how the surface is embedded, it should matter. Yeah, so here I forgot to say, this is the state sum always about the defects. Yeah. And for this, one can look at the torus, for example, embedded in S3 or also in the ball if one wants. It doesn't matter. Um, and yeah, to make life simple, one can just label this torus. Um, so one has on the outside, one has some group acting. On the inside, one takes the trivial group and the torus is then labeled by the trivial G set. Well, that's the simplest one can choose. And in this case, one can realize this torus in, in quite an explicit way. So they're like pipes, triangular pipes connected by some joints. And um, one can compute the state sum. And then it just gives um, the number of group homomorphisms from the fundamental group of the knot. So the embedded knot, torus gives me a knot. So from the, the fundamental group of this knot complement into the group G up to conjugation and then the cardinality of the set. So that's the simplest example, yeah. If you if you add a twist here, then what sort of formula do you get for at this point? If I have a twist to torus. Yeah, sorry, I mean a twist, uh, apologies. A twist, so vec g omega rather than vec g. Okay, so if I get a twist, I have not computed it. I don't know what is the result, but I, I could certainly compute it. You mean the three core cycle? Yeah, 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 I get. Yeah, my question is if you add a three core cycle to the definition of vec g, if you get some 
still some description in terms of I want of the of the, of the some so, twisted character variety or something. Um okay. So in principle, but when you add this three core cycle, you have to also add a three core cycle to the um to the to the bimodal category. So the G set also must have a, a three core cycle. A two core cycle, yes. Yes, okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. yes. And basically how this how this condition here comes up, this comes up purely from the conditions on the group elements. So um Basically, this this would also be there that you have something from the that, that you get that you get the group homomorphism, but you would get a weight that comes from the co-cycle. So you would have the conditions on the group elements are the same, and therefore this appears also. But the different group homomorphisms get different weights that come from integrating these these co-cycles, and then of course this integration over the co-cycles can become quite large and un unpleasant, I think. But in principle, that's what you get. Okay, so the final example um, I want to look at are ribbon defects. So that's also a consistency check and also to relate it to the earlier work by um, Toral Pierre-Lissé and Balsam Pirillo. So what do I mean by this? So basically I can always label a defect surface with a transparent defect. Then I have a spherical fusion category as a bimodal category over itself. But just because the defect surface is trivial, it doesn't mean that the defect lines and defect points have to be trivial. And in this case, the bimodule functors, the bimodule endofunctors of C, and the bimodule endo natural transformations, they're just given by the categorical center. So the center Chelsea was talking about, and many other people also. So this is the center. So then the defect lines and defect points are labeled by the center. Okay. So in principle, I can ask now, how can I realize like a ribbon inside the, the three ball? Um, in principle, I have two ways of doing it. I could just say, I put a surface in the middle and I put a defect surface. I give it a transparent labeling. Inside of the defect surface, I put a knot diagram or a ribbon diagram, I should say. And then I just label in my diagram. I label the line segments of the diagram, the objects of the center. I label the crossings by the bimodule natural transformations giving, given by the braiding. And in this way, I evaluate. But that would not be what I would consider a ribbon. That would be what I consider a ribbon projection. And it's quite clear that one can do this ribbon projection. But what is interesting in this um, in this um, Formalism is not to do a projection and to put in by hand the braidings, but how the braidings come up from a ribbon that is just really a ribbon three-dimensional space. So this one can do, and whenever one puts a ribbon link as a defect in the three ball, one can show that the state sum is just the state sum one would get without the ribbon link times the evaluation of this ribbon link for the center. And this is precisely but um, yeah, what was, um, so this is the link diagram. So DL is the link diagram that I get by projecting, but the, the, ribbon, the link itself is three-dimensional. And this reproduces the result by Torah and Berelisi. So it's literally exactly the same, although it was derived in a different framework. And here I just want to illustrate how one can get the braiding really from something three-dimensional um, in, this, in this formalism. And this comes up by gluing defect tetrahedra. So here I have three tetrahedra, they all have transparent defects. So this tetrahedron on the left has a, has a defect line labeled by functor. The tetrahedron in the middle has nothing, just a transparent defect surface, and the tetrahedra on the, on the right has another defect line labeled by functor. And now I glue the front of the middle tetrahedron to the back of this tetrahedron. And then I glue the front of the tetrahedron here to the back of the tetrahedron in the middle. So then afterwards, um, I, can, I can evaluate this. So each of the tetrahedra has a 6J symbol. And these six J symbols I can write down. They more or less look like the usual six J symbols for a spherical fusion category, only that they have like an added line labeled by something of the center. Here I, I just get the usual six J symbol for a spherical fusion category, and here get another one that is um, with the line labeled by the center. So then I glue them together, and then I can just use the, the rules for the for the diagrammatic calculus to evaluate what one gets. And what one gets 
is after summing over the simple, simple objects and multiplying the three evaluation is a diagram like this. So this is the result of the calculation, but this is also precisely the diagram that I would associate with the tetrahedron that has a crossing um, on the defect surface, which I've laid it by hand with the braiding isomorphisms. And so in this way, one gets back the usual um, data and um, one can also realize ribbon links. And I think I'm already over time. Ah, oh, okay, no. Okay, so um, like what is the outlook? So what I would really like to understand better is what is described by this defect data. And I think it's, it's, it's a good thing in this description that one can really uh, compute things quite explicitly. For example, to, I could now consider a torus embedded in some ball for example, labeled also by a co-cycle, and I could also have like defect lines on it and so on. So this is something that is interesting to me. And the other question, um, which is of course the big question, is how to, how to consider the case where I have different defect surfaces that meet in a stratification. Like for example, I could have like something that looks like a book with the different sides, uh, pages of the book um, meeting in a defect line, or I could have something that looks like some grid inside of the three-dimensional one. And in this formalism, I simply do not know how to do it. So it's in principle clear that this would involve like tensor products of bimodule categories, but tensor products over the spherical fusion categories. And this is difficult to implement in this formalism because um, all the tensor products over the spherical fusion categories, they are there, but they are obtained from the summation. So I do not input any tensor products of bimodule categories or the linear products of bimodule categories. I do not put them into the state sum. They come up from the summation and from gluing everything together. So in this formalism, I simply don't know how to treat this, this case where several defect surfaces meet, because in this case, I would require the tensor product of bimodule categories over C, so over the spherical fusion categories, but th then I cannot define uh, just the evaluation of the tetrahedron because I have already to input the summation. And so I don't know how to treat this in this formalism. And if anyone has any idea on this, I would be really grateful um, to discuss. Okay, thank you for the attention. Any questions? So when you put the defect on the torus, yeah. um, uh, the number that you get uh, also the state sum, mm -hmm. does that, uh, is, is that like a, a Venus Brown dimension for the fusion ring of bimodule? So when one puts it on the torus? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I don't know this in general. I mean, it sounds, it sounds plausible. But you mean then for a general bimodule category? I don't know it. I mean, it's a, it's a good question. So I would expect, but I cannot say yes or no. Yes? Are you uh, right? Uh, zero invariance or Morita invariance uh, using group the techniques you just talked about or maybe using other techniques? Sorry, I couldn't acoustically hear it. Oh, uh, Morita invariance. Right if one can see it in this formalism, yeah. I don't think one can see it any better than one can see it without the defects. Because, I mean, so if I want to introduce defects, then I have to already pick some spherical fusion categories. And essentially, all this formalism is doing is, is kind of it's weakening. So I can see defect surfaces and so on are somehow weakened spherical fusion categories. So I don't have one spherical fusion category, so I have different ones. and Somehow, but it's I cannot I cannot see this explicitly in this formalism, and I think in principle it's not it's not logical to me why the formalism would. Okay. There's a, a slick argument for showing Morita invariance in functional homology using by extending it to the defects on the circle. And, uh, okay. Yeah, that, so this is a good suggestion. I don't know. Maybe we can discuss this later. Yes. I, I think this should work. So you should be able to find defects which have two Morita equivalent uh, spherical fusion categories on each side. Um, these should be actually special. This is realized by special um, 
modular categories uh, because you have to implement pivotality. Mm -hmm. So what you have to do, you have to trivialize the relative share functor over of these modular categories. And then uh, you can realize, uh, I ex or I, that I understand, I expect that you can realize Morita equivalence by inserting a little yeah, bubble yeah. of this yeah. and then expanding it and it wraps everything very much as uh, you can realize Kramer's value type dualities in two dimensions, right? Yeah, that's kind of that, that will work. And the relevant theory for module categories that's in a paper by Cesar Galindo, David Jaklic, Jürgen Fuchs, and myself. That's where we develop the Serre Functor formalism. But are you suggesting that this formalism is, is substantially more useful than any other way of describing Toral Piro? Um, I mean, you could also consider this, for example, with orbifoldization or with, um, well, probably with, with the modular functor that you have constructed. So is this, is this supposed to be more useful or are you just saying how one would, would, would do it in any of these formalisms? Well, the main advantage here is that you can also still learn something in case TFT is not fully constructed in the sense, uh, so in the non-semi-simple setting and you can get representation theoretic identities. That's the additional benefit. Okay, so I was not aware of this, but this. Is yeah. So this, this nicely fits together. So maybe somewhat related to the discussion, I was trying to work out during your talk. I mean, so there's there's this way of constructing TFTs from the Kolborism hypothesis building up, mm -hmm. and another way of starting from state sums and building down. And it, it feels to me that you're close to sort of starting at the top level and being able to define something all the way down to a level of a point. Is that, um, yeah, do, do, you, do you imagine that you can you can show that the that the state sum that you're constructing really is the same as the, the one given by the Trins, the Douglas, uh, Schumer, Fried, and Snyder? Uh, so I expect that maybe I could one could show it, but then I would I, I expect that this issue that I mentioned will come back with the defect surfaces that intersect. Wouldn't I need also to have the possibility to have um like say I don't know different defect surfaces that meet like more than two that meet in a line um in order to have this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's like more general than than just what would be the opposite. This is like an application of something of like the proportional hypothesis with singularities, but here. So you meant with, with the defects, or you meant to just do this without the defects? Well, I guess okay. I just I guess I just meant even if you didn't a priori care about introducing defects, if you're going to start at the top and uh, drill all the way down, you have to have you have to indeed deal with defects. Um, so, so this is something that for maybe for diecraft witness is, is, is well pretty understood. This is just how to compute the diecraft witten for the various situations, and this this has been done. And this should, in principle, fit together there. But I think outside of diecraft witten it's really very hard to compute this. But I think this is not something that is, is kind of yet now special to, to this, this work with defects. This is something, some more general question about this, this kind of state sum model approach and the, the cobaltism hypothesis one. Okay. All right, let's uh, thank the speaker again. Yeah.